Hello everybody, my name is Julia Newton and I'm here for this webinar um, this evening. Um, I'm a clinician working in the northeast of England in Newcastle and uh, what I'm going to present over the next um, 20 minutes, half an hour or so is my experience of managing chronic fatigue syndrome and how we're now beginning to take some of the research that we've been doing here in Newcastle and um, taking those the knowledge that we've gained um, into the clinic. So we're just going to sort the slides out a little bit so that I've got a slideshow. Um, so for you, if, those of you that aren't familiar with CFSME, um, it's really a very common um, disease that affects uh, some reports say between 0.2 to 0.4 percent of the UK population um, and the average GP practice will have about 40 patients with um, the diagnosis of CFSME which is probably a considerable underrepresentation. So um, on the second slide which I hope that you can see here um, there this is showing the locality of where I am at the moment in the northeast of England and how close we are to Scotland. And um, I get patients from all over the UK, but particularly from Cumbria and um, Northumberland. So in actual fact, some of the distances that patients will travel to see me in, in Newcastle is no greater than it is from Scotland. So um, we do get quite a few Scottish patients um, down to see us and we're always delighted to see them. So in terms of CFSME, um, you'll be aware that there's no known cause of CFSME and as a consequence there's currently um, no available biological based treatments. So at the moment in the clinical services that have been established um, in England, the treatment is largely supportive um, and involves graded exercise therapy and cognitive behavioural therapy. As you'll probably realize, chronic fatigue syndrome is um, essentially an umbrella diagnosis. Um, to make that diagnosis, um, individuals have to have a constellation of symptoms, so there's no biological-based diagnostic test. And as a consequence, there's a huge um, heterogeneity of patients that make up this group known as CFS. That can be both a problem um, for researchers and for clinicians. So a lot of the research that we do is um, made more complicated by this heterogeneity. And in terms of clinical management, again, it, it can be problematic. But what I'm going to talk about this evening is primarily um, two areas, autonomic dysfunction. And I know that next week you're going to have a sit webinar from my colleague, Professor Jason Ellis, who's also going to talk about sleep problems. So the focus tonight is on autonomic dysfunction. So the autonomic nervous system is that nervous system that does the things um, in your body outside your conscious control. Um, and the main area that it has its influence is on our cardiovascular system that's represented here on this slide. So you'll see that the heart is right at the center of this vascular system with your legs at the bottom and your brain at the top. And there are areas of pooling of blood in your lungs and, and in your gastrointestinal tract. Now, our body is physiologically um, orientated to ensure that our brain is always perfused with blood. Um, but uh, as a result of our evolution, where we've gone from Neanderthal man with our heart and our head in a line with each other, to assuming an upright position, that's meant that our heart is always having to pump blood against gravity to keep our brain perfused. And that physiologically is a challenge for us. So as I stand up, 700 mils of blood drops into my legs. And as a result, my autonomic nervous system that's doing the things outside my conscious control without me being aware of them, detects this drop in blood pressure as the blood pools in my legs. And the baroreceptors in the arch of my aorta detect that, and then the autonomic nervous system sends an impulse to my brain, where um, it, that's then processed, and subsequently, the autonomic nervous system via my sympathetic branch sends um, an efferent loop that then says to my heart, go a little bit faster, and my peripheral blood vessels uh, to constrict, 
all aimed at pushing up the blood pressure in order to keep my brain perfused. So it's all about blood pressure, the head of steam that gets the blood around your body. And if that head of steam isn't high enough at the um, sort of extreme end of things, you'll um, not get enough blood to your brain and you'll end up blacking out or having syncope. At the middle end of things, you, when you stand up, you may end up with postural dizziness. And at the more subtle end of things, um, you won't get enough blood to your heart, your brain, or your muscles. And that's what I believe manifests as the symptom of fatigue. So part of the problem um, that I believe patients with CFSME experience is related to a problem of dyssynchrony between the responses of standing up, and that's physiological stress of standing, and how your autonomic nervous system responds to that. And if that response isn't quickly enough and the microsecond response that we need to keep our brain perfused, otherwise we get symptoms, if that doesn't happen fast enough, that's what results in um, the problem known as dysautonomia. So if my hypothesis is right and problems with dysautonomia or autonomic dysfunction are more common in people with um, CFSME, we'd expect them to describe symptoms related to um, blackouts and postural dizziness. And we can actually quantify that um, using very re well-recognized, validated tools. In this um, case, we're using something called the orthostatic grading scale. And this is a tool that we use routinely in our clinic. It's available to download from the web. And it's a simple ticky box form, and if People who complete it score four or above, that's consistent with orthostatic intolerance. So you can see on this graph here, along the bottom are a range of fatigue-associated diseases, um, CFSME included. The second group are a group of controls without fatigue, and all of them have a score of four or below. But you can see there's a wide spread um, across um, all the other diseases where fatigue is a particular problem. And if we summarize those um, results from those patients in the orthostatic grading scale, about 90% of patients with CFSME will have orthostatic intolerance. Patients with fatigue-associated diseases like fatty liver disease or primary biliary cirrhosis um, will have over half of them um, having orthostatic intolerance. We now use this tool routinely in a lot of our um, chronic disease clinics and in our um, CFSME clinic here in Newcastle. And in every disease that we've studied to date, um, what we find is that the more symptoms of postural dizziness and autonomic dysfunction people have, the more fatigued they are. So there's a relationship between the two. And that led us to suggest a number of years ago um, that in the group of patients with CFSME, this um, royal blue box here, that a proportion of them, a large proportion, will have what we um, termed as dysautonomia-associated fatigue. And that if you take patients with chronic disease, of whom a um, proportion um, will be fatigued and a proportion won't be fatigued, depending upon which chronic disease you choose, that in the fatigued group, a proportion of them will also have dysautonomia-associated fatigue. And this is important for us as clinicians, because if we can identify dysautonomia in patients, then this is a potentially treatable um, cause of the fatigue that we see in both CFSME patients and in um, a proportion of those with chronic disease. So that's symptoms, but what about objective um, abnormalities of autonomic function in patients with CFSME? Well, one of the simplest ways that we can measure that is to simply look at the head of steam to actually measure blood pressure. And we can do that using ambulatory devices. Um, this here is um, mean systolic blood pressure over 24 hours. 
And on the right side of the screen, you'll see uh, the results from over 100 patients with CFSME compared to um, over 100 matched controls. And they're matched for age, sex, and activity level. And a fatigue-associated disease on the right, primary biliary cirrhosis. And you can see in both cases, but particularly so in the CFSME cohort, that the head of steam, the blood pressure, is significantly lower in CFSME and fatigue-associated diseases compared to their matched controls. And um, I show this slide to illustrate what actually represents uh, nearly a decade of my life. But when we use a range of different objective autonomic function tests, in this case, something called heart rate variability, and we consistently show that patients with CFSME or fatigue-associated chronic diseases, that they have objectively identifiable abnormalities of autonomic function compared to controls and compared to um, non-fatigued chronic disease patients. So in terms of um, that response to standing, um, we've talked about postural dizziness, but also if my hypothesis is right, we would expect that patients with CFSME would have problems um, or a greater propensity to have drops in their blood pressure when they stand up. And um, on the slide here, this looks like an instrument of torture, but actually this is something called a tilt table. And in my clinic here in Newcastle, we use this as a um, tool to look at physiological responses to standing, particularly in patients with syncope or blackouts. And there's evidence-based guidelines that um, direct how we utilize this as an investigative um, tool in patients with syncope. So using this, it looks like a bed when it's flat, but um, it mechanically brings our patient up to standing, and they stand on the platform at the bottom while we monitor their heart rate and their blood pressure using a continuous device shown here on the right-hand side of the slide that measures beat-to-beat -beat blood pressure and heart rate from your fingers. And this allows you to look at very subtle changes in blood pressure in response to stresses such as standing up or other maneuvers like a Valsalva maneuver or if we um, ask patients to do things like cough or sneeze. Um, so this is a very useful diagnostic tool um, that we can use in the clinic um, for patients with syncope. But we've also used it in a research context um, initially in patients with CFSME. And this table here shows the results from 64 patients with CFSME who have um, had a tilt table test, and their results are compared to a group of age, sex, and activity matched controls. And the things I want to illustrate to you with this table are firstly that um, the patients with CFSME were significantly more likely to have a positive tilt test. And what that means is that they were more likely to drop their blood pressure in response to the stress of standing. And that would be consistent with neurally mediated hypotension or vasovagal syncope. The second thing to illustrate for you with this table um, is at the bottom here that patients were significantly more likely to have um, a diagnosis of positional tachycardia syndrome. And I'll come on and talk a bit more about both these two conditions um, in the next few slides. Positional tachycardia syndrome we're now finding in almost a third of patients with CFSME. Um, we've now had three series of patients, and that finding has been replicated by an Australian study, um, suggesting that in patients who are labelled with CFSME, this may actually be a condition uh, that we need to identify because it's potentially treatable. So if we think about neurally mediated hypotension and syncope, um, it's something that we are currently directed with um, NICE guidelines. So there are um, 
TLOC guidelines, Transient Loss of Consciousness guidelines, and I would recommend them to you if you um, have a period of insomnia, because it's quite a heavy read. Um, but essentially, there is evidence to support our management of patients with syncope. So identifying those who are diagnosed with CFSME who have syncope is very important. And in the next few slides, I'm going to run through how we manage syncope in patients with and without CFSME to give you an idea of the sorts of things we ask people in our clinical um, history taking and subsequent management. So the things we look for are cardiovascular syncope, thinking about arrhythmias, um, um, etc. We um, look at out for things like orthostatic hypotension, so do people drop their blood pressure um, when they immediately assume the upright position. And we also look for these reflex or neurally mediated um, causes for syncope. And the thing perhaps to consider in patients with CFSME, and this is something that we've encountered while we've been doing tilt table tests with patients, is that when we're with them and we're tilting them and they're experiencing symptoms, the patients will often describe symptoms to us that to us as syncope physicians are characteristic of presyncope. So the sense of impending um, blackout, that they need to sit down, that there's tunnel vision, spots before their eyes, um, for example. But actually when you speak to a CFSME patient, they just tell you it's their typical CFSME symptoms. And it makes you begin to wonder whether it's about people's perception of the symptoms they're experiencing, what they mean, and perhaps how clinicians have perhaps reinforced these in previous encounters. So when we um, see a patient with syncope, the things we um, tend to do are take a thorough history and do an examination. Everybody has a lying and standing blood pressure measured, and everybody gets an ECG to look for potential risk factors for cardiac arrhythmias, such as long QT, for example. And everybody gets bloods and other routine tests looking for potential causes for syncope. And the things we try and think about in our history is, is it really syncope? Could it be that it's somebody who's having hypoglycemia or um, epilepsy, for example? And what's the underlying etiology? Um, could it be um, arrhythmogenic or is it um, that people are dropping their blood pressure? And what potential um, risk factors do they have for further syncopal episodes? And what we think about during that consultation is whether or not the individual needs a tilt table test. And most patients with vasovagal syncope don't need a tilt table test because clinically it is so obvious um, what they're experiencing. So the sensation that they're dropping their blood pressure, that they, um, the episodes are happy, happening um, in response to changes in posture, and uh, perhaps after meals, um, they're classical vasovagal syncope. Patients have a prodrome, they're then unconscious for a few seconds, and they, um, they then recover fairly rapidly. But we tend to recommend the tilt table test if patients have unexplained syncope, or if there's some sort of diagnostic uncertainty. So if you have a patient who's perhaps labeled with chronic fatigue syndrome and you're beginning to question whether or not they may be having um, pre-syncope or syncope, then a tilt table test may help you establish that diagnosis. And in a tilt table test, there's no such thing as a negative test. It's really important that um, the blood pressure is dropped. So if you go through the protocol of a tilt table test without dropping the blood pressure, um, then that test has been suboptimal and you need to give more provocation to that individual. And what's important is to see whether the um, person who you're tilting has full reproduction of their symptoms. So um, do they recognize the symptoms that they're experiencing? 
And there are a range of different protocols that people use. You'll see here um, that you bring the person to standing. Uh, we use a protocol that's called the Italian protocol, where we tilt people um, for 20 minutes, then give them one squirt of GTN as additional provocation. Um, the important message um, is that it's an extremely safe test. There are no reported complications from a tilt table test. And we reassure patients that the worst that will happen is that we'll bring their symptoms on. And we explain to them that that actually is the point of the test. We want them to have symptoms so we can see whether this is symptom reproduction. And this is what a positive tilt table test looks like. Um, you can see on the um, fourth squiggly line down that this is blood pressure. And the blood pressure is um, slowly drifting down through the tilt test. And the red um, line down shows where we brought the table down um, and, and the patients assumed um, a flat position. And they have reproduction of their syncopal symptoms in association with a low blood pressure. And that's consistent with the diagnosis of vasovagal or neurally mediated hypotension. And the important thing about that as a diagnosis is that there are evidence-based treatments. So um, essentially, we withdraw culprit medications. So um, I spend my life taking people off um, vasoactive medicines. We encourage people to drink um, two and a half liters of water a day. And um, I'll come on to talk about some of the other simple things in the next few slides. But in terms of potential medications that are of value for vasovagal syncope, um, the mineralocorticoid fludrocortisone um, has uh, been shown to be a benefit in vasovagal syncope, as has the alpha agonist midodrin. And there's a little bit of evidence that the SSRIs um, can work on central blood pressure receptors and as a result be um, um, efficacious in vasovagal syncope. So in terms of simple things that we recommend to people that are, are known to be effective, um, we encourage people to drink at least two and a half liters of water a day. And it's amazing how many people um, find this difficult to do. Um, so we generally recommend that people consider water as their medicine. And they take their medicine four times a day and take a pint each time. We encourage people to reduce the amount of caffeine that they drink. And there's as much caffeine in tea as there is in coffee. And um, lots of people take high volumes of Coke as a stimulant because they think that improves their fatigue. So we encourage them to reduce that. And in people who have a low blood pressure, we encourage that they increase their dietary salt intake. And there is um, some physiological evidence that if people are feeling symptomatic, getting um, blood out of their big muscles, such as their arms and their legs, uh, using maneuvers um, such as squatting and arm clenching and um, leg crossing before they stand up, can avoid people actually blacking out and reduce presyncope. The final thing we recommend, and there is, is evidence to support this um, in, um, as being achievable in patients with CFSME, and that it does reverse some of the autonomic abnormalities um, that we find in patients with CFSME, is a maneuver called tilt training. You can see on the slide here, it's a simple maneuver. Um, we encourage people to stand with their feet 15 centimeters away from the wall and that they become the hypotenuse on the triangle with the uh, wall and the floor being the other two sides of the triangle. And we um, ask them to do that twice a day for as long as they can until they get symptoms, up to half an hour. And people will sometimes start off managing a few seconds, and we encourage them to keep a diary so that they um, can see how over time um, they will be able to tolerate longer and longer of tilting. The rationale comes um, for this from work done in Europe where um, 
tilting people with a formal tilt table test um, has been shown to be effective and in Europe people will be kept in hospital and tilted every day until they are no longer syncopal and um, we locally have adapted that to home tilt training and there is good evidence that this will reset people's autonomic nervous system and allow them to tolerate the stress of standing um, for longer. So does it work? Well, um, whether or not treating people's um, neurally mediated hypotension works in CFSME, um, the jury is still out with this. But certainly reducing um, people's syncopal episodes when they have vasovagal syncope reduces um, fatigue. So vasovagal syncope we know is associated with fatigue in this paper from our group in Europace. Um, quantified fatigue using the fatigue impact scale in people with vasovagal syncope and in people who respond to treatment and we reduce their syncopal episodes, their fatigue severity is reduced. Um, so we would suggest that this um, um, underpins um, the abnormality in chronic fatigue syndrome and we can extrapolate that it would work in that group as well. So I'm just going to move on now for the um, last few minutes to talk about positional tachycardia syndrome which is a second form of dysautonomia that we routinely look for in patients with CFSME and again represents a potentially treatable um, um, form of dysautonomia. So positional tachycardia syndrome is another form of orthostatic intolerance and it's um, defined as symptoms that occur on standing relieved by lying down and associated with excessive tachycardia on standing. And interestingly, a lot of the symptoms that patients with POTS describe are um, overlap considerably with um, those of CFSME. And the degree of functional impairment that those with POTS describe is um, comparable to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and and congestive heart failure. But despite that, it's um, very poorly understood. There are very few established services for POTS and people are frequently misdiagnosed as having severe anxiety, panic disorder, or as we're seeing um, recently, as having CFSME. Um, on this slide, there's just a few facts and figures for you to illustrate how common it is. I'm not going to read those out, um, but what it does is illustrate to you um, that it's a very common disease um, and affects generally the same demographic group as um, we see in CFSME. It does seem to run in families and the symptoms, as with CFSME, will vary day to day. And here are the symptoms that are documented in patients with POTS. And again, you'll recognize a lot of those from patients that you see with CFSME. So it, it's very difficult sometimes to differentiate between CFSME and POTS patients on the basis purely of the symptoms they describe. But what we do see in POTS is a hard diagnostic criteria. Um, and it's defined as symptoms of orthostatic intolerance in association with an increase in heart rate um, to above 120 or by 30 beats per minute uh, within the first 10 minutes of standing or on an upright tilt. Um, and this hard diagnostic criteria is very simple um, to test for in the clinic and um, is easy to do um, simply with an ECG machine, um, it doesn't need any specialist equipment and often patients will come and see me with diaries where they've used heart rate monitors um, that are commercially available and they've uh, made the diagnosis effectively themselves. And this just shows you um, what we look for. Um, you can see on the graph A um, that the heart rate is um, bobbling along and then when the person um, stands up, the heart rate increases by 30 beats per minute. And graph B is after they've been treated with um, the drug Evabradine. And associated with that was a significant symptomatic benefit for this individual. And that case is reported in, in Europace in 2008. 
And in terms of the symptoms, we've done a survey recently of our POTS patients in the clinic here and POTS patients via the National Patient Support Group, POTS UK, and I would strongly recommend their website to you, www.potsuk.org, because there's an awful lot of very um, valuable information there. And um, what this survey of symptoms um, confirms is that um, patients with POTS are highly symptomatic and have comparable fatigue levels to patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, but um, are particularly affected by orthostatic symptoms. Um, so if you have a patient with CFSME who has really significant orthostatic intolerance, um, let a flag um, go up, hopefully, in your mind to think about um, POTS as a possible diagnosis. And this um, is a complicated table that's just here to illustrate um, some of the um, difficulties that we currently have with POTS patients. This is the results of our survey of um, our POTS clinic patients and POTS UK patients. And um, this is the different treatments that this, um, the different patient groups have, um, were taking at the time we did our survey. Um, and um, overall, there were 21 different drug regimes, but ultimately about a third of patients ended up on no tablets at all um, because, um, as with CFSME, we're using the physiological properties of these drugs um, to slow the heart rate down in the hope that this will allow people to function better. And in some people, um, they found the side effects were potentially uh, more problematic to them um, than the, the benefits. So um, it's still a work in progress in terms of treatment with POTS. But some patients do get significant symptomatic benefit from beta blockers, uh, which appears to be the, um, the drug class that is used most um, frequently. So um, in conclusion, um, I hope I've um, convinced you that chronic fatigue syndrome ME is a common debilitating disease, that autonomic dysfunction, be it positional tachycardia syndrome or neurally mediated hypotension are common findings in those with CFSME and they both represent potentially treatable um, problems um, that underpin CFSME. I hope I've given you some strategies to um, begin to um, tease out the patients that may have these forms of autonomic dysfunction and opened up some um, treatment opportunities for you to consider and um, hopefully um, we will now have some questions that you may like to ask me. Okay, so um, on the screen at the minute we've got um, the people who support our um, research work here in Newcastle who it's important for us to acknowledge. Um, Action for ME are um, heavily involved with funding some PhD students for us and ME Research UK who are based in Perth are extremely generous to us um, and uh, for that we're extremely grateful and we've uh, more recently had some funding from uh, the Medical Research Council um, and we're about to finish that, that project. And from the point of view of research, if, if any of you are interested in hearing or understanding a bit more about the research, uh, uh, which is very biological based, lots of MRI scanning, etc., then we do have a research Facebook page, um, and I would uh, commend that to you. It's MECFS Research Newcastle. Um, so in terms of questions, uh, I have a couple of questions here, which I'll start off with. Um, um, I've been asked a question what initial assessment and investigations would I like a GP to do prior to being referred to me? Well, um, in the chronic fatigue syndrome services in England, there's a minimum data set um, that is required before patients will be seen in the, in the uh, NHS funded CFS services. And that includes blood tests being normal and um, urinalysis, um, a celiac screen, um, thyroid blood tests, etc. Um, in terms of um, the particular service that I run, I'm very interested in um, looking for forms of dysautonomia. So um, I tend to um, see people with CFS, ME, who, 
who people are querying whether that might be an associated diagnosis. So we like to have um, perhaps heart rate um, lying and standing if people are querying um, positional tachycardia syndrome um, and um, a history of blackouts or near blackouts or postural dizziness are the patient group that I tend to see predominantly. Um, next question, um, what's the relationship between um, POTS and ME-CFS? Um, so um, about a third of patients that we've seen now in three series of patients, and as I said um, earlier on, um, also an Australian group has found a similar proportion now, about a third of patients with the label of um, ME-CFS will have POTS if we test for it. Similarly, in patients with POTS, um, we um, see about 50% of them will be fatigued and 50% won't be fatigued. So it's often very interesting how people come to our clinical service. We have POTS patients that have come to us via cardiologists or geriatricians, um, but we also who are fatigued, but the predominant symptom is their palpitations. Um, and then there's this group of patients with um, ME-CFS who may come to us because um, it, there's an increasing awareness of this condition in people who have had a diagnosis of ME-CFS for a long time. But the second part of this question is, um, can POTS develop in ME-CFS patients over time? And one of the things I often get asked is, isn't POTS just a representation of deconditioning? And I suspect that in some people that can be the case. So I think if people have been recumbent for a long time, um, that their autonomic nervous system um, finds it difficult to cope with um, the additional stress of standing. But I believe that in the vast majority of patients, POTS is the um, precipitating um, problem that causes their symptoms. And if you talk to patients with POTS, they are usually very clear that their tachycardia started around the same time as their ME-CFS started. So they, they are quite clear um, that the two things, or in fact, in some instances, they can be clear that the tachycardia started and then the fatigue came along subsequently. Um, so that goes back to my umbrella again. It may be that you know, we have a variety of different POTS, and certainly um, it's known that there are two different types of POTS, a hyperadrenergic and a dysautonomic. So it may be that if we tease out all these diagnoses under our umbrella of CFS, that we will begin to find neurally mediated hypotension, that we'll find POTS and perhaps even different types of POTS. And that as we begin to um, develop evidence-based treatments for each of those different um, problems under the umbrella, then we'll begin to um, develop treatment algorithms that um, allow us to treat people most appropriately depending upon which diagnostic group or phenotype um, they fall into. Okay, so another question, um, what resources and information can I point patients towards? Um, well, Action for ME obviously have got a very good um, set of resources available online. Um, POTS UK um, has a very good uh, website with lots of material. I frequently point um, patients uh, towards POTS UK that I see in the clinic. Um, they're, they're a very effective organization. Um, in terms of tilt training, the protocol for that is available on um, the hospital website where I work. So Newcastle Hospitals, um, NHS Foundation Trust, and if patients put um, tilt training into the search engine, that comes up with the protocol for that. Um, if anybody has any questions, do feel free to add them onto um, the um, the list, and I'll I'll happily get to those. Um, otherwise, I'll carry on going down the list. 
Um, any suggested reading for health um, professionals on dealing with autonomic dysfunction and fatigue in ME-CFS? Um, well, I wrote an article a few, um, probably about a year ago now, um, which was published in um, Europace, um, which was um, entitled Managing Fatigue in the Syncope um, Unit, um, so I would recommend that. As I said, the um, fatigue um, nice guidelines are, um, are worth a read, although at the moment there's not an enormous amount about autonomic dysfunction in that. Um, the TLOC nice guidelines, um, again, are full of lots of information, so um, that again is something worth reading. Um, what specialist services are available for this client group? Well, um, in, the, in England, um, we have NHS services. So in the north east of England and North Cumbria, um, we have a clinical network for CFSME, which is um, coordinated by Gavin Spickett, who's an immunologist. And um, that service, um, there are five different clinical services within the um, northern region. And um, they're funded um, by the NHS and by commissioning. Um, I run a my clinic, which is slightly um, separate from that, where we look particularly for dysautonomia in CFSME and fatigue-associated chronic diseases. Um, and having been up in Scotland recently in Edinburgh, I met um, a couple of people from... Um, Lothian and um, I understand there are um, emerging clinical services um, which are being very well received by um, patient groups so I would recommend that if you're looking for specialist services um, it's worth finding out from either Action for ME or your local health board what's available. I do see referrals from Scotland and we um, probably get one or two a month where the health board has approved um, for people to come and see me. And as I said at the beginning of my talk, um, the distance that people travel from over in Cumbria, um, where we provide the CFS um, ME service, is probably no different than um, it would be from Scotland. So um, I think the distances are not a problem to come down and, and see me. And, and uh, you know, people generally give us very positive feedback so I think people value um, the service and in terms of comparable POTS clinics um, in Scotland I'm not aware of um, people who have a particular interest um, who are based in Scotland but I do know that there is a list of POTS clinics on the POTS UK website so if you're looking for a Scottish service it might be worth um, um, having a look on that website. In terms of what services and support um, I would like to see for this um, client group, well, obviously I'd like um, the diagnosis and, uh, and investigation of POTS and neurally mediated hypotension integrated into the routine clinical assessment of patients with CFSME. Um, and then as we do more research, um, I think it's imperative that that is quickly um, integrated into um, the clinical services that are um, well established. I think at the bare minimum people should look for orthostatic intolerance and begin to recognize um, that this is a significant problem in this patient group and that there are um, treatments that are available, some of which are very um, simple and um, you know the water drinking the conservative measures are very simple maneuvers that um, people can do very easily um, and um, then the medications um, that we use are very safe and very effective so I have no further questions at the moment if um, if anybody has a question for me um, then please um, do put it up or else we will and bring this session to a close. 
There is a competition going on, so um, if my colleague Jason Ellis, who's doing the one next week, um, gets more questions than me, then I'll be very upset. So um, if, if you have a question, then please do feel free. Um, and if not, you've got my email address there on the screen. So if you have any questions subsequently, then um, please feel free to um, email me directly and I'll do my best to answer it. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time and um, uh, I'll leave you to have a good evening. Bye-bye.